welcome everybody um, to uh, our next um, Earth Science Women's Network um, uh, event um, for our new season. Um, so uh, welcome back if you joined us um, from our previous season in July um, and are back for another event um, and welcome to everyone who's, who's new. Um, so today we have an event all about a um, narrative series um, and we're joined um, by three really awesome panelists, um, Laura Louts from the National Science Foundation, Hilary Noon from UK Research and Innovation and Sean Sapkari from the Luxembourg National Research Fund. Um, and we're excited to have everyone join us. Um, so a little bit about what to expect um, during this event. Um, so we have uh, a welcome and introduction uh, for five minutes, which is what I'm doing now. Um, followed by um, all the talks, um, which will be appropriately titled uh, when we get there. Um, and then followed by a panel discussion and Q&A, followed by breakout rooms, um, and then we'll close the event. Um, so if you have any technical issues during the event, um, please send these through um, to the questions host, um, who will be labelled in the participants um, uh, list. Um, also a disclaimer, this is an Earth Science Women's Network hosted event with speakers from different international funding agencies. Um, so a bit of housekeeping, um, so please remember to abide by ESWN's code of conduct, so when you registered, um, you should have um, signed this. Um, if you somehow found yourself here without having signed this, um, please take a moment to go to our website um, and have a look and then peruse this. Um, so all aspects of this event, except for the breakout rooms, um, are being recorded um, for those who can't join us live. Um, this event is fully closed captioned. You can um, activate um, or hide the captions as you like um, using the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll be muted for the duration of the event. Um, if you found that you can unmute yourself, um, please don't so that we have a nice quiet environment for our speakers. Um, please remember to send your questions through to the questions host um, via the chat directly. Um, also remember to share your thoughts in the chat as um, the event progresses. So we're all virtual. Um, so um, remember to, to share what you're thinking um, so that our panelists can see and also participants as well. Um, if you have any tech issues, then um, please also remember to send these via the chat to the questions host. Um, so a little bit about um, the Earth Science Women's Network, um, if you haven't come across this before. Um, so ESL the UN is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to increasing diversity across the geosciences with an emphasis on creating and supporting a nurturing community, working for cultural change to eliminate barriers to a diverse scientific workforce and empowering scientists through professional development. Um, and there's um, a board, an associate board of directors, um, and together with Karina and Dreyer, um, who's also um, here today, and Lani Duet, who's also here. Um, so we sit on the Associate Board of Directors um, within different committees. Um, so why do we choose to host the event? So firstly, um, we ran a member event survey last summer, um, and one of the clear outcomes was that people really wanted uh, more interaction with funding agencies. Um, secondly, hopefully demystify different types of narrative style CVs um, and maybe convince them to use um, maybe convince you to use them in your recruitment processes um, and to also improve your knowledge about narrative style CVs so that you can review and write them with ease. Um, so a little bit um, about um, narrative style CVs. Um, so it's a very, very quick introduction and um, our speakers will talk more about these. So they're CVs which allow a variety of experiences to be highlighted. Um, they're generally written in a pro style format and not every CV format is the same, and hopefully all of our speakers will, will explain more about this within their talks. So um, now um, it's my great pleasure to um, briefly introduce each of our speakers, um, so they'll introduce themselves um, in more detail when they go through their talks. Um, so Laura Louts from the National Science Foundation, Hilary Noon from UK Research and Innovation, and Sean Sepkari from the Luxembourg National Research Fund. So each speaker will present a talk, um, and then this will be followed by a panel discussion. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to Hilary for her talk. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen okay. That's a great start. Um, so I'm Hilary Noon, uh, Research and Innovation Culture Lead at UKRI. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an 
introduction to what UKRI is for anyone who's not familiar. So it's the largest public funder of research and innovation in the UK. Um, it brings together nine of the discipline specific research and innovation funding councils, it's accountable to government and has a wealth of um, uh, partnerships across uh, lots of different sectors, um, not just nationally, but also internationally. Um, and UKRI has a really unique role to play in stewarding the UK research and innovation um, system to reach its full potential. And our vision is about um, an outstanding research and innovation system in the UK that gives everyone the opportunity to contribute to and benefit um, and enrich in lives locally, nationally and internationally. So just a little bit about um, UKRI to give a bit of context to the work that we're doing. So we recently published a new strategy, Transforming Tomorrow Together, um, which is underpinned by four principles of change, um, which is diversity, connectivity, resilience and engagement. And these are principles which are fundamental to everything that we do as an organisation so that we can help the UK research and innovation system really flourish. Um, and to help create these conditions, the research, cult research Innovation Culture and Environment team at UKRI um, work in partnership with the councils that I mentioned and different teams to really catalyze efforts to shift research culture. Um, the directorate comprises of four different teams that work really closely on interlinked and interconnected projects and priorities that include EDI, research integrity, open research and research and innovation culture. So I'm going to very briefly introduce the research innovation culture team because this is where it, it, a lot of our um, narrative CV work sits. And a lot of the work that we do is dedicated to driving the co-development of positive r &I culture through shifting what's visible and valued through diversity, connectivity, so innovating new ways of partnering and sharing, resilience, creating shared solutions to shared problems and engagement, reaching out to all of the communities that we serve. And a really good programme that exemplifies all of this is actually the work on adopting um, or for ori like narrative CVs. So this is about us helping adopt uh, a CV that's based on the Royal Society's resume for researchers, which I'll talk about a little bit more, but really part of a wider piece of work on reward and recognition systems. So some of the reasons why UKRI and others are adopting this new type of CV is about it's reducing bureaucracy. So, you know, lots of people apply to and review for many different funders across the global or and i system. And so we've got like a kind of single approach to describing a track record. It makes it easier for people um, uh, to do an, in terms of a consistent expectation. It allows more inclusivity by allowing better description of varied career pathways, reduces the focus on continuous productivity and enables a broader range of ideas and people and outputs to be highlighted. It helps us create the right incentives. So a really healthy function or an ICE system requires a breadth of activities and contributions. Um, and we need to be able to see and value a lot wider range of these as well. Team science and collegiality, so recognizing all of the different skills and effective teamwork that's needed to work on these collaborations and contributions and supporting colleagues and others. Reducing the barriers between disciplines and sectors, so giving people the opportunity to be able to contextualize the significance of some of their um, achievements or impacts but also about responsible assessment. So instead of just focusing on the people being like reduced to a set of lists or metrics, really looking at the whole picture of the applicant and the contributions and the experience that they bring. And there is a, a two fold or two parallel strand to this. The UKRI has committed to adopting these narrative CVs across all funding opportunities that require a uh, track record by the end of 2023, as well as it's a published guidance on it line just um, yesterday, in fact. So um, we'll be able to put a, a, a link to that in the chat. But just with UKRI changing, that's not going to change the culture. So we've actually joined up and developed two communities of practice, one of which the members you'll hear from today uh, with Sean. Um, and these are really like helping come together and align a lot of the activities um, and resources so that we share best practice. So they cover all sectors, all countries, all stages of the journey. They share knowledge and learning, 
uh, develop aligned resources, so things like training um, and some more, and also share these publicly through things like an international event, which we'll be able to post in the chat as well, so you can see how we bring others along with us, um, and also share the, um, the resources through a resume library. So the efforts of these two communities of practice are really helping to combine to minimise unnecessary bureaucracy to shared approaches and accelerate culture change through not just looking at use of these CVs and funding, but also alternative uses. So everything like from recruitment, promotion, mentoring, chartership, you name it. Um, so that collectively, these allow for a more accelerated um, uh, uh, and authentic culture change across the system. But really, to give you a little bit of a whistle stop of where these came from. So I'm doing this mostly for myself. I think it's always useful to know where things came from to understand where you're going. So there's really these communities of practice are really responding to uh, a really sustained and ongoing call from the ORI community asking for improved research culture. So some of these headlines are probably familiar. And it's really like the widespread frustration that employers or funders are at least perceived to focus on a narrow range of metrics relating to past funding and publications when assessing researchers or people who work in research and innovation in hiring and promotion and funding decisions. And this is regarded by people as being one of the key issues in driving poor research culture. But the work that we're talking about today isn't something that's new. This has been going on for a while. So back in 2014, uh, which seems like a long, doesn't it? Ten years ago, soon. <laughs> um, uh, there was a Nuffield Council in the UK commissioned um, a, a report on um, the culture of scientific research in the UK, and it was really one of the reports that led to the groundwork um, about the different factors that shape research culture, and it gave a really amazing umbrella view in terms of like how UKRI and others could start to address some of the issues around research culture in a more systemic and structured way. Um, and it also really helped address some of the underlying issues around research culture that can really um, ripple across and negatively impact it. So the things that were identified was the narrow definitions of success um, are combined with an overly competitive um, um, a system. And following a really big survey with the community, it provided the evidence and data that the perceptions from researchers was that something really needed to be done. So then over 2018 and 2019, the Royal Society built on this and drew on lots of other established international things like the biosketches, assessment matrices and application forms, but really importantly with the ORI community. So they undertook a, a big consulta consultation exercise with a lot of different events, different people. So people across organize, different organizations, academia, national academies, industry professionals, career development professionals, early career researchers. And what they did was they developed a CV that moved away from the gnarly focused performance indicators to make it easier to see reward and nurture a full range of contributions that are really necessary to create the environments that enable excellence and steward it for the future. And this is where they came up with the resume for researchers. Um, and we've got a link to that as well at the Royal Society that we can put in the chat. And this was really quite different because it was about looking at things that researchers really wanted to see visible and valued. And this like brings us to what uh, we had at the very start, which is the iceberg model. And it's a really excellent tool the narrative CV and helping us really shift what's visible and valued in research and innovation. So for example, in a funding, we often make prospective assessments um, on the value of a research project, uh, using track record, uh, list of publications um, and things to date. But is that really assessing what matters? Is that all that researchers contribute to? Um, and when you look at what's below the waterline, there's a huge, amazing, like excellent contributions that are going on there. And then what incentives are we creating when we take that approach? So essentially, this is a, a tool that really helps us try and get below the waterline, really see the whole applicant and the whole activity and all of the skills and experience that make the whole person. Um, so this is really, you know, a whistle stop tour of the history. So it was developed from a need from the community, 
around key issues uh, to address key issues identified in reward and recognition systems. They co-created the resume for researchers, which the Royal Society um, uh, uh, piloted. And then what we've done with the Joint Funder Group and the Alternative Uses Group is that we're working together to support widespread adoption of this. So what is it, right? <laughs> A lot of people have tried to come up with a definition, um, such as the one here on the left has been piloted by Dora. So for those who might not be able to see it, it's a narrative CV format that provides a structured written description of a researcher's contributions, achievements that reflect bro a broad range of relevant skills and experience. So if you even replace that and see that that could basically be a, a really flexible format. And the resume for researchers, which is developed by the Royal Society, was essentially that, a narrative CV statement, which was complemented or structured over four modules and then came with a personal statement as well. And then the resume for research and innovation, which was being developed by uh, UKRI, is basically an evolved version of those, which is basically um, made to evolve to be more inclusive um, of all of the population that works in research and innovation. So that could be technicians, it can be industry researchers, you know, it could be knowledge exchange professionals, library staff, a whole range. So to, for it to be a really effective tool, it must provide value when used by people working in research and innovation in a wide variety of situations. So that could be working in different disciplines, different career stages, or those who work independently or part of large teams. So the four main structures of the modules are how you've contributed to the generation and flow of ideas and hypotheses, knowledge and tools. So this would be, you know, not just publications, but data sets, projects, software, publications, artwork, you name it. How you've contributed to the ORNI community, and this could be your contribution to the research and innovation culture. Uh, how you've also um, supported research teams and development of others. So this can be around uh, mentoring, supervision, but also how you've actually helped shape the direction of an organization. And then broader society, you know, how you've actually worked with the people who've informed your research all the way through. So on to the help. Now, this is a new territory and we are all joining up in terms of being able to share best practice. And this is just a little bit of a summary slide of how UKRI are helping the sector adopt narrative CVs. So we've created two communities of practice, which I mentioned earlier, which are made up of lots of different kinds of people and organisations across the sector. And these are feeding into um, resources that are being developed and shared to the resume library. So these include things like um, uh, EDI, templates, starter guides, but also training so that anyone anywhere can actually access um, as an applicant or reviewer to be able to be part of this journey. And I'll go into the shared evaluation framework in a moment, but generally you can see how all of this will feed into a whole area of impact that maps on to the things that we've looked at earlier in terms of the flower. Um, and just to give you an idea, so this is something that we've developed in terms of evaluating this process, and this is a commitment from members of the Joint Funder Group and the Alternative Uses Group about how we're making sure that we're not creating any unintended consequences. So in this area, we look at like the larger circles represent more responses, and this is from members of the Joint Funder Group in terms of why they're adopting it. So a lot of them are looking at it about creating the right incentives, response for research assessment, as well as commitments to uh, research culture and inclusion. Um, but also in terms of, you know, demonstrating to the community that we're listening to the feedback and the changes that um, are needed and also continuous improvement and sharing knowledge. So the shared evaluation framework is going to be used to evaluate all of the use of the narrative CVs in different contexts. Um, it contains two modules, one on the experience of the process from an applicant and a reviewer perspective. And the second one is on EDI in the broadest sense. So everything from your squiggly non-linear career pathways right through to things like, uh, ED, like socioeconomic background. 
So they're still being in development and the data that will be shared from these will be made publicly available so that we as uh, uh, adopters of these CVs and also the ORNI community can see the development and changes of this work. This is all going to be shared in the resume library, which I mentioned before, um, and this is a freely available to everyone all over the world, not behind any paywall, because we want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to engage in this um, and across all different sectors as well. And just a very, very whistle stop tour. Um, this is some of the members of the joint funder group. This is growing all of the time. Um, you'll see that they're actually um, from across the world, and this is one thing that we're really quite proud of because um, we are a global ORNI community. Um, so this is something that we'd like to be able to expand and grow on. And this is the um, alternative uses group. Um, so this is representing all of the um, different organizations who are adopting this across the world, um, which is growing and growing every single day. So I think we've got about, 17 funders and about 30 different uh, organizations across the world. And this is feeding into a much wider um, aspect of global movement in terms of uh, work around reward and recognition. So some might have, you've obviously may have heard of DORA, but also things like the metric tide, you know, looking at the role of metrics in research management in terms of the work by the, um, Science Europe on response to the research assessment and the Global Research Council, as well as national strategies that we have from our government to really help, you know, um, wider contributions be visible and valued in the system as well. So that is my whistle stop tour in terms of uh, history and the help related to narrative CVs, and I'm going to stop there. Great. Thanks so much for your talk, Hilary. Um, so now um, I'm going to hand over to um, Sean Zakkari from the Luxembourg National Research Fund um, for his talk. Thank you very much. So my name is Sean Sepkariu. I'm program manager at the FNR, responsible for various things, but uh, in terms of this, all things around research culture and research assessment. Um, I'm going to focus more on the practical implementation and evaluation of the narrative CVs because we have implemented a narrative CV since uh, for about two years now. And I want to talk a little bit more because, A, I mean, starting off, we agree with everything that Hillary has talked about and, and the motivations and, and descriptions that are there. We're happily involved in the joint funders group and uh, happy to push this forward together. But in, to kind of like narrow down and focus, I want to give a little bit more uh, detail. Um, but of course, starting with some high-level fun as well. So this is uh, actually from the, the UKRI. Oh, I hope this is okay that I'm presenting <laughs> an event from, from, from Hillary. Uh, this was uh, earlier this year around the resume for research and innovation. Uh, kind of like a how-to and, and what's going on, all about the process. And the, the UKRI CEO, Adeline Leiser, said, you know, if you want to ask your nephew what they want to do when they grow up, they want to experiment, explore, and discover, not that they want an H and X of 60, right? And then my boss, Mark Schiltz, the Secretary General of the FNR, said that when we talk to researchers and ask about their research achievements, it shouldn't be that they publish two articles in Nature, but rather the science that they've done and the contributions to the society and the greater and the broader public. And I think these two quotes set the scene for a little bit of the why. Uh, that we want to move in the direction of narrative CVs and responsible research assessment and research culture, um, which Hillary has already done a great job of, of introducing. I love this picture and the slide to show that how kind of complex yet, you know, important and overarching research culture is. Because, I mean, if you look at this definition from the, the Royal Society, um, it is it determines everything, right? How research is evaluated, conducted, and communicated. So it's, it's vital to, to our very communities at all aspects of it. Um, so culture is in any way, shape, or form, and in all ways, shapes, and forms underpinned by values. And very recently, Science Europe, a kind of organization of research performing organizations and research funding organizations in Europe, has developed and launched or publicized a kind of um, a, a, a research culture, research culture value framework, research value framework that there is in the bottom, um, that the link can, you can throw in the chat uh, is, is kind of fundamental to all the research that we 
should fund, right? The idea that these six areas, right? Autonomy and freedom, care and collegiality, collaboration, equality, diversity and inclusion, integrity and ethics and openness and transparency. These are the, the values that should ground and should, should everything that we do should derive from these values then it should promote these, these areas and drive towards a better understanding and a better um, culture driven by this. Um, just so, yeah, so, but then to talk about the narrative CV and this then deriving from these values, the idea of the narrative CV from the FNR's perspective to increase diversity, right, of what comes in, what is what we can fund, what we see in our proposals and, and what kind of research is, is done in Luxembourg. And we wanted to balance kind of the quantitative side, I can make a, a laser pointer, the quantitative side. So, you know, metrics, responsible use of metrics, not just willy-nilly metric, metrics, quantitative information and traditional outputs with kind of this, you know, scientific vision, the potential of a researcher, and their broader contributions to science and society. So we um, mandate that our researchers and people who submit proposals must have an ORC ID to kind of take care of the quantitative side of things. And for the qualitative side of things, we have this narrative CV. And a little bit on how ours was developed. We took this resume for researchers that Hillary uh, in, uh, has presented and even the resume for research and innovation, same four sections uh, that Hillary just presented. And then we added um, two things. So a space for kind of a increased or a broader personal statement, a vision, what does the researcher or research, the applicant want to do? What is their vision for themselves, their research, their, their group, their motivation? And then space to outline their career progression. So talking about caring responsibilities or career breaks, or I say non-research activities, for example, one narrative CV mentioned the person went for a year long sabbatical to learn about science communication and then came back and that that influenced, you know, their future career in, in, in research. Um, so you, of course, have a link here and I'm happy to share slides to, to our profile. All of our stuff is, is on the internet on our website because we're all about kind of sharing the learnings that we're doing just in line with the joint funders group mentality as well that we're moving together forward as a sector. Um, we also, I think it was early this year, did a training workshop. Um, the web, uh, the website is, is here as well and you can drop the link in the chat. And we kind of had you know, we answered questions of, okay, why, what do you, what do you need to know from us? What, how can we help you write this as an applicant? Um, and what do you think and what feedback can you give us about narrative CVs? So I wanted to share with you a little bit about the feedback and a couple slides of what we did in that workshop. You can see, of course, more here on, on the website. We also did very importantly, a, a survey before to understand our community, what they were expecting, what they need in terms of training. And I wanna share with you some of these results. So we asked first, what are the benefits? Um, and this is these are all from our community. I didn't, you know, write this, you know, for for this this talk. Uh, people believed the researchers are. Uh, believed that there was more space for details of the research and broader outputs beyond objective facts, right? Things that are not visible through metrics or lists, other important aspects of research, which are not highlighted, this iceberg model, and then allowing for context, right? Focusing on the strengths of the research or not that they should be, you know, try to fit into all these boxes, but what are their strengths and how do those strengths apply to the proposal that they're, that they're submitting? Supporting uh, the squiggly career paths, um, or giving space for, for gaps, right? So allowing for increased flexibility um, and uh, yeah, and examples. Yeah, so another thing that came up a lot was people want examples. We don't really see a good use of examples because there's no best narrative CV. It's contextual, it's based upon the, the individual, their career profile, their history experience, and of course the proposal that they're submitting. So uh, we push towards people interacting and learning from each other and getting support from others. We're working on, uh, well, there are discussions of a database for examples um, in a DORA discussion earlier this year, or it was even last year, a, a, it was suggested that a massive resource of, of um, narrative CVs would be helpful. Uh, it is my opinion that rather than a resource, a database of CVs, a database of people to, to connect and share experiences on how to write and relate their experiences that are quote unquote atypical would be even stronger. Um, 
and then here's some quotes, right? So uh, narrative CV reveals the personality and passion. It in leads to a fair and inclusive it's assessment. It focuses on the person and their story. And you should play to your strengths and don't compete on metrics. So what are the more difficult aspects, right? Because it's new, it's changing. It's, um, and our community said, how do you choose the most relevant information to highlight, right? You have to avoid being too heavy or too complicated. Um, it's easier for those with good narrative no good writing skills or native English. Um, and yeah, it's, it's hard. Here I added the second bullet point. Um, a proposal has the same issues, right? Because it's all about writing skills in a proposal. It's not necessarily different. Um, it's more about the support that you get from others. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then balancing the quantitative and the qualitative. How, do you, how much evidence or justification should people include? And it's much more subjective than, uh, a, uh, than a quote unquote, you know, academic CD, CV, which can be argued, but this is the opinions of our community. It's not accepted by everyone. Uh, people haven't had practice because it's very new. Um, being precise and focused is difficult and it takes up more time, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. There's great work done by Dora talking about how um, when you take less time, you're prone to have to focus on shortcuts and to, which leads to bias, uh, conscious and unconscious bias, which is not exactly how we want things evaluated. Um, this is uh, um, the four areas that Hillary showed earlier from the, the research resume for research and innovation. Um, the, the kind of tips that we gave, right, that think about how your work contributes to science and society, broader than just publications, right, show a general contributions. Again, focus on your strengths, right? You don't have to be everything to all people. And then sometimes achievements can be part of multiple areas, right? So something that you've done helping people could also have, you know, contributed to a broader society, for example. Think, think broader also with your own achievements. Um, Hillary showed this, the, this slide earlier in a different form, so I won't spend too much time on it, but the idea is that in these four sections, there's different things that you can, that you can add, right? So the hypotheses can be, you know, a broader range from beyond publications. Open science is, of course, vital and important. Um, Teams and individuals is also a very important aspect, mentorship, supervision, helping other people advance uh, is the idea there. Contributing to the wider research and innovation community, all the work that you've done for others in science and research, and also the recognition that you've gotten from others. And then of course, broader society isn't just the people on the street, or it's also industry and government and, and everybody, including research users in all aspects of the research process. And of course, the, the traditional communicating results to the lay public. One more slide on uh, tips and best practices. Again, it should be tailored. I'm, I'm a bit of a broken record at this point, but I think these are important messages to take home. Um, you don't have to be amazing at everything. Example CDs are not, CVs are not ideal because quality is subjective. Depends on what you think your strengths are and what the evaluator thinks are, is right for the proposal that, that they're evaluating. And context is really the, the critical word here, right? So it's not that the CV is the main thing that you look at and say, okay, well, this person has this many publications in these journal article, in these journals, therefore they're good. It's more the proposal, the idea, the scientific concept that you're putting forth is important. And the, the CV then is context. Is this the right person for the job? Provide evidence where you can, um, because it's uh, one of the, the negatives coming from the reviewer side is that it's a bit hand waving, right? That people say you can, you can say anything you want, but it's hard to kind of prove some of this. So where you can focus, uh, pr provide evidence, right? And focusing on content and not quantity. Um, if you can link to it, you know, provide DOIs or whatever links to things that exist. This is an add a plus preprints or um, I don't know, photo galleries where you're communicating with the public or, or whatever you, you can, honestly. And then very, very, very important training practice and support are more important than language skills. I've heard many things from other funders and we've seen this in our data, which I'll show you is it's more, it's more important that you get guidance and support from others than that you have a perfect English comprehension and, and ability to write. Um, use all the resources available to you, professional and personal. Uh, look at the guidance that exists. We have a couple links and guidance in our template, but there's other things around there if you look for narrative CV guidance. And then ask everyone around you um, for reading and revising your narrative CV and proposal too, for that matter. Okay, 
um, in addition to implementation of the, the narrative CV, we have gotten a feedback survey as well. Um, we've put this on the web so everyone can look at it. This I want to show you data from 2021 and a little bit of 2022 preliminary, da preliminary data that is not yet online, but it will be next year. Uh, so for what we've learned from our applicants is that researchers are generally okay, right? Only 20% are negative, although in this year it's moved down to like less than 10%. Uh, but the issue that we have is guidance. Um, you can see here that the applicants, 22% are negative about the guidance and the reviewers are around 13 with 37 being neutral. We've bumped that up this year. I think we're again around 10% for, for both with much fewer, many fewer neutral reviewers. So we're getting better there, which is great. Um, the most surprising thing here is how, how the community applicants and reviewers are accepting the change. People, applicants feel that, you know, the, the CV allows for their achievements, a broader range of their achievements to be demonstrated, still around 20% negative, again, reduced reduction in this year. But reviewers, 71% of reviewers felt that the CV was useful in their evaluation, and our reviewers are from outside of Luxembourg. Luxembourg is a small country. We, uh, to minimize or to eliminate conflict of interest, we only ask for reviewers from outside of the country. So this suggests to us that the international community is totally fine and embracing of the change towards narrative CVs. And this is maintained this year. But from this year, preliminary results, forgive my weak PowerPoint skills, uh, when we asked how much the applicants how much support they've received when completing this narrative style CV is all over the board, and this is the a bit scary that there's not a general constant amount of support from you know similar institutions. We have demographics that'll come in the report, but the, the fact that there's no kind of clear one or two things here, I find a little bit odd. And this is something that we need to be concerned about as funders and also institutions need to know this as well. Um, there's, of course, critical feedback as well. We don't want to only focus on the positives. Some people say that um, uh, there's not enough space to put all the achievements in, but the idea is a, to move away from you know, valuing quantity, right? Uh, the ORC ID can still show publications, so it's still in the evaluation, which is fine for us, right? Publications are still important. It's not that it's that we don't think that they're important. We're just trying to shift the focus from just publications. Narrative form will benefit those with good writing skills. We've talked about this already, so I'll skip it. And the narrative CV takes more time to write and evaluate. So I've talked about slowing down decision making. And it's important for funders and others to reduce burden in other areas. We're working currently at the FNR on reverse, reducing burden on project reporting. But then I have some data that I would like to show you that shows that this isn't fully true. Uh, when we asked the reviewers how much time it takes to review a narrative profile, a narrative style CD, you see how, here a bell curve, right? And with a little bit of a tail towards a little bit more. So it's not exactly taking a whole bunch more time to, to evaluate. And if you look at complexity, is it more or less difficult to assess? Again, a bell curve. So this argument that it's harder to assess and it takes more time from the reviewer perspective is not exactly supported by the data, um, which is, I think is a nice sign towards international acceptance of, of this change. I wanna finish here, cause I know I'm a little bit over time. Um, with that this is we're moving forward in this on a global level a recently very recent the agreement for reforming research assessment has been launched at an eu level um, 350 organizations from over 40 countries were involved in the development with 51 initial signatories i think it was last week including the fnr um, and uh, the idea here is to, to, to push things forward towards a more uh, qualitative of evaluation and more responsible research assessment. And narrative CVs are within kind of the scope of, of moving in this direction. So I invite you to, to look at the, the agreement here and to sign or get your institution to sign if you can, because the more we do this together, the better. And then I want to finish with a, a similar slide to Hillary's that we have lots of groups that are working on this and moving this uh, in, the, in the right direction because we need to do this together. Culture change is something that we need to perform together or we won't move at all because research is an international community and doing it together is the only way. And with that, thank you. And I'm happy to take questions uh, later on. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'll move on to um, the talk by Laura Louts, um, all about the NSF perspective. Okay, hi everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Laura Louts and I'm a program director at the National Science Foundation. My primary program 
is hydrologic sciences. And so we fund basic um, research on the terrestrial hydrologic cycle. So um, I guess I'm switching gears just a little bit to talk about the NSF biographical sketch or biosketch and try to weave in comments from Hillary and Sean and how that relates to the NSF style CV. So um, just a brief introduction to the National Science Foundation. The National Science Foundation is one of a constellation of agencies in the United States that fund uh, science research and development. So we have NASA, the USGS, NIH, NOAA, NSF is one of these federal funding agencies. Um, we're a small agency in the US. Um, even though we are a relatively small agency budget-wise, compared to like the National Institutes of Health or the Department of Energy, we have a big impact on US research and that's because we have a very low overhead. 95% of the funding that NSF receives goes out the door as grants for research or research facilities and education. And that's essentially because um, unlike some other federal agencies in the US, we don't have um, in-house research scientists like actually doing research. We're comprised of program officers that are responsible for reviewing proposals and directing federal funding out the door as grants to researchers primarily at academic institutions. So um, NSF doesn't explicitly use uh, narrative CVs, but all NSF proposals require what's called a biographical sketch or a biosketch for all senior personnel. And the biosketch is a very highly structured document. Uh, perhaps, well, I, I'm learning more about narrative CV, so I was thinking about how it contrasts to a narrative CV. CV. It sounds similar in that there are sections and those sections are like highly prescribed in the type of information that you can include. And so biograph NSF biographical sketch example is shown here. Um, this is for a real person, um, King Hubbard, who you may know as a hydrologist. This is a famous uh, researcher kind of uh, many decades ago, um, but I created this as just an example that um, is for a real person, but not a person who actually created their own bio sketch. So I think the key question is, why is this bio sketch required for all proposals and what function does it serve? And that kind of explains why it has the elements that it does. So at NSF, there are two merit review criteria against which all proposals are evaluated. And these two review criteria are the intellectual merit and the broader impacts. And the intellectual merit criteria encompasses the potential of the proposed work to advance knowledge and understanding in the scientific field of study. And the broader impacts criteria encompasses the potential of the proposed work to benefit society and contribute to the advancement of specific desired societal outcomes. And it's really important to know that at the National Science Foundation, both criteria are given full consideration during the review and decision-making process for every single proposal that comes into found the foundation, regardless of the topic or the focus. And strengths relative to both criteria are necessary and strength in one area by itself is not sufficient for us to make an award for a given proposal. You have to do both. Oh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so when we evaluate NSF proposals, reviewers, and these could be ad hoc reviewers that are writing written reviews, these could be panelists engaging in discussion of multiple proposals, all of these reviewers are asked to consider the five questions that are shown here. And in the first question, you see specific attention drawn to this, these two criteria I mentioned, intellectual merit and broader impact. So reviewers are, of course, asked, will the proposed work advance knowledge? and will the proposed work benefit society? Then there's a series of four other questions. And these four questions apply to evaluation of both the intellectual merit and the broader impacts. So for example, when asking if the work is creative, original, or tra potentially transformative, that's in terms of both the potential to advance knowledge and the potential to benefit society. So I just draw your attention to this particular question. Is the team well qualified to do what they propose in terms of both the intellectual merit and the broader impacts? 
And the purpose of the biosketch is to give reviewers the information needed to answer this question. Is the team well qualified for what they propose? And that's both with respect to advancing knowledge and benefiting society. And we very much ask reviewers to rely on the content of the proposal for their evaluation and not other information. So we do not want reviewers, you know, going out and doing independent research on reviewer on um, the team's qualifications. We want them to rely on the information in the proposal. And that's why we ask people to provide a biosketch and we ask for specific types of information. So this is essentially your opportunity as a PI to provide information to help reviewers answer these particular questions um, in, in, in the biosketch, you know, particularly your qualifications. Okay, so kind of on a very practical level, um, the NSF biosketch is limited to three pages. It can be no more than three pages, and it includes only four elements. There are no other elements that can be included in the biosketch. So it's a highly structured CV, I would say with narrative elements, and I will get into that. Um, the content it includes your professional preparation, your appointments, your products, and your synergistic activities. And I see actually some overlap now that I understand more about narrative CVs about these categories and how they might be very analogous to the um, content in, in narrative CVs. And I would say that standardization of the format and strict limits on the content removes any temptation or opportunity to include. Um, various metrics like the H index was mentioned, there's no opportunity to include this in a biosketch. So, um, you know, you're, you're, you're not um, having to make choices about those sometimes controversial metrics. And you can't really pad publication lists with just, it's not, it's not um, about the, the quantity as Sean talked about, and I'll, I'll get more into that. So let's talk briefly about these different sections. And I, I wasn't going to spend much time on the first two sections because they're like, really prescribed and I think easy to understand, and that's your preparation and appointments. Um, so these first two parts of the biosketch simply report your training and your current and prior appointments. Um, your professional preparation information is limited to simply your institution, area of study, degree, and year. You don't include your dissertation title, although that could be listed as a product if that's an important product to list on your CV. And you don't include things like the name of your graduate advisor, which I think avoids some of this sort of um, focus on um, pedigree or, or, or name dropping, Not, it's a casual term. <laughs> um, so appointments are any titled position. You can include anything. You could include, you know, if you're a professor, affiliated faculty, adjunct professor, visiting professor, visiting scientist, researcher. You know, in this case, I'm showing a biosketch for someone who's had both academic and non-academic appointments. And positions should be listed whether they are paid or unpaid, full-time or part-time. And so you can include different types of appointments that you have. Um, it's also, we require foreign appointments outside of an institution uh, to be disclosed. And this helps us evaluate things like conflicts of interest. So the next two sections are slightly more flexible and I think more relate to the discussion we're having today. There's the product section and the synergistic, synergistic activities section. Um, products are scholarly works that reflect your qualifications for executing the work proposed in the proposal. And all investigators are limited to a total of 10 of these quote unquote products. And you're asked to provide five products that are closely related to the project and five that are significant, but may, may not be related to the proposed project. And so limiting the number of products to 10 removes any I think focus on kind of quantity and focuses on the quality and especially the products that most demonstrate the competency of the PI in terms of the um, completing the proposed work, both for intellectual merit and broader impacts. Selection of what to include should vary proposal to proposal. So you should be tailoring a biosketch to the particular proposed work, because if you're gonna list the five products most closely related to the project, that presumably may vary from proposal to proposal. You can include things like, of course, publications, um, but you can also include data sets, software, patents, copyrights. Everything has to be citable and accessible. So you can't include things like unpublished papers, papers in reviews, invited lectures, right? Things should have um, ideally a DOI and be discoverable 
um, if, a, if a reviewer wants to access any of those products. Um, the last section is synergistic activities. And I would say this is the most unstructured component and has the most room for narrative elements, um, trying to connect to the idea of a narrative CV, CV that Hillary and Sean talked about. And I think it's really important to think about the merit review criteria at NSF. This is an opportunity to demonstrate the broader impacts of your professional and scholarly activities. And you can focus on integration and transfer of knowledge, as well as the creation of new knowledge. So examples of things you can include are innovations in teaching and training, contributions to the science of learning, development or refinement of research tools, um, computation methodologies, algor algorithms for problem solving, development of databases that may support both research and education, um, efforts and successes in broadening participation of groups underrepresented in STEM and service to the science and engineering community. And so given these are the kind of, this is the guidance on what to include in a bio sketch, I just turn your attention back to the NSF merit review criteria related to broader impacts. This is a standard slide we often show PIs to help them understand what types of activities NSF um, thinks about when we think about this criteria of broader impacts. And this is not an inclusive list and it's not a checklist. We don't expect people to do all of these things. We don't expect people to limit themselves to the things on the slide. This is more supposed to be inspirational and to get you thinking about what broader impacts may look like. And so um, broader impacts could be effective and evidence-based approaches to improving teaching, training, and learning from the K through 12 to postdoctoral levels. Um, at NSF, we have a very explicit focus on broadening participation of communities that are underrepresented in various fields of study, in my case, the geosciences. And we know this is an area where there is um, much needed improvement. And so we're really um, eager to see PIs um, be effective in this area and show evidence of their effectiveness in this area. We're interested in development of partnerships with industry, other federal agencies, non-academic partners, um, outreach to enhance scientific understanding and engagement beyond academia. So it could be even like work at science museums or uh, social media. Enhancement of infrastructure and other potential impacts like informing policy decision or engaging stakeholders. So what could it look like to try to demonstrate in your bio sketch that you have competency or, or qualifications to be successful when you propose work in these types of areas? And that's where I think the synergistic activities can be important. So this is just an example. Synergistic activities can be really brief, like some people essentially include a bulleted list. Some people include a lot more narration and um, given a three page limit and the limited content of a bio sketch, there's actually, I think, more opportunity for narration in this section of the CV than people often consider. Um, so this is just an example. You could include things like service to professional societies or being an editor of a journal, which are kind of classic community service activities. Um, you may have um, gone on a lecture tour, been selected as a distinguished lecturer and kind of um, engage with the community broadly in that way. Or you could include narrative components. I, I created some very brief examples of here, like maybe advocating for um, innovations in teaching and learning in your field of study, or maybe developing new um, models or conceptual frameworks that are highly influential and kind of are, uh, are transformational in your field of study beyond um, just the academic community. So in closing, um, just a few other tidbits and loose ends. Uh, you include biosketches for all personnel um, in a in a NSF proposal, all senior personnel. You can also include biosketches for other personnel. Like if you have um, proposing a postdoc and you've already identified the postdoc that you want to hire for the particular project, you can include that person's CV or for a research technician. And interestingly, these bio sketches, since they're uploaded as kind of supplementary information, can be free form and don't need to follow the structure of the bio sketch. Um, I also want to mention a tool. Um, given the constellation of funding agencies in the US, um, there's not, you know, complete standardization of CVs or bio sketches, but there is a tool called 
Psy NCV. I'm actually not even sure if that's correctly the pronunciation, but it, it, it reads as you see here. And it's a free system where you can assemble a professional profile for your grant applications. Um, it is used at both NIH and NSF, so that's nice for standardization. And it allows you to pull data from outside sources. So Sean mentioned ORC ID or ORCID. I never know how we're supposed to say that, but it's a tool for, you know, you could, you, it allows quick personalization of a, or, or I should say, um, customization of a, a biosketch for a particular proposal, because you can kind of click which publications you want to put in different sections or whatever those products may be that you want to pull from that system. Um, it also allows you to like create multiple documents, keep those as PDFs, and you can also delegate editing privileges if you're so lucky to have someone that would help you create your um, biosketch for your particular proposal. We also have an NSF fillable PDF, but I, I actually think the SI and CV is, is better because um, there's greater flexibility in the space you can use for the synergistic activities, I find, than the fillable PDF. So I think there's more opportunity actually for narration of the synergistic components um, in that SI and CV. So I will stop there and happy to answer questions and thanks for your time. Great, thank you so much for your talk. Um, Great to hear um, another narrative style CV perspective. Um, so thank you so much um, to all our speakers for um, really, really great talks. Um, so now we'll now move into the panel discussion. Um, so thanks to everyone um, who registered for sending in your questions via the registration form. So there were a lot of questions that came in, but we found some common themes and we've narrowed it down to some key questions within four different themes. Um, so we'll post the leading questions um, in the chat so that you can follow along. And also, um, if you don't get your question answered um, just now, there'll be um, another opportunity to ask more questions during the breakout sessions. Um, so our first theme um, is good practices for narrative CVs. And I will po paste the main questions into the chat. So, um, First question, what do reviewers and panels most value and look for in a narrative style CV to ensure that they can make a decision slash recommendation? What length should a narrative style CV be? What should the earliest CV entry and applicant should mention? Are pictures allowed in a narrative CV? And should interdisciplinary researchers mention anything extra in the narrative style CVs and synergistic activity sections? Um, and to start us off with this theme, um, Sean, we'll start. Yes, thanks. Um, excellent questions, all of them. Um, they're a little bit diverging, so I'll try to see if I can either answer one at a time or find answers that kind of cover all the, the areas. So reviewers and panels, what they look at to make a decision and recommendation, it really varies, right? The idea of the narrative style CV is that it's context for the proposal. So for example, if we have a, or a funding scheme that's around PhD candidates, right? So funding PhD, students, then the, the panel will look at things around supervision and, you know, ability to manage large groups and, and these sorts of stuff, right? If it's a kind of a traditional research project, then they'll look at different types of stuff, right? Or, you know, if it's a health project, maybe the person has had experience dealing with patients, patient organizations, I'm a biomedicine uh, background, so that's, that's where my mind goes, right? So it really kind of depends. Um, and it also depends on the discussion between the panelists and, and you know, what the reviewers pick out. Uh, in terms of length, I think all of us have, have shown that, you know, you, want, you don't want it to be sprawling. Um, one of the main reasons why we moved to a narrative CV was that our panels uh, were telling us, our panelists were telling us, we had freeform CVs, people could put out whatever they want, and they would get CV lists that were longer than the proposal themselves itself. And, and the idea was, let's, no one's going to read 50 pages of CV uh, for however many proposals come in. So we limited ours to two pages. Laura was just saying there's this three, something that is overseeable that a reviewer is not overwhelmed and with burden, with increased burden just around a CV, right? We shouldn't make it difficult. Um, and then, uh, so pictures allowed. So we don't currently allow pictures. It's a text. Um, it's a, it's, we have a Word document. Um, if, you, if you go for an online tool, it would be kind of an online text box. So we don't currently allow that. But I mean, links to places where pictures are, right, in, in publications or preprints or whatever, like this is, this is fine. Um, and then interdisciplinary researchers mentioning 
um, I mean, yeah, of course, right? If you're interdisciplinary and you have good outputs or, or can, can explain it or back it up somehow, then by all means, anything that is your strength that contributes to the, to the proposal is, is of added value. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess I was just going to build on Sean's comments ab about what reviewers and panels most value and look for in, the, in, in CVs, whether NSF style or narrative style. And I actually think um, <laughs> I have to acknowledge that before this session, I'm not sure how much I really critically thought about the NSF bio sketch, right? It's been around a long time and um, it's gone through a little, a little bit of adjustment, but it was interesting to think about it in the context of this discussion. And I now see it as I see more opportunity there than I fully realized to address reviewer criticisms or potential criticisms, especially with regard to evaluation of the broader impacts criteria at NSF. So for example, sometimes people will propose, you know, they're doing a, a maybe a traditional research project, but they want to integrate an educational component. So they want to work with middle school teachers to develop new curriculum um, related to their topic area. And you might hear reviewers say, well, what experience does this person have? Have they ever developed curriculum? Have they ever worked with a, a, a middle school teacher? Um, do they have any training in education? And because our letters of collaboration on projects are so limited now to standard text, you know, you could provide a letter writer, you know, a, a middle, the middle school teacher you're working with, or, or, you know, the educator you're working with could provide a letter of collaboration, but it contains standard language. It doesn't elaborate. And so um, I think if you're proposing something like that, it's a good idea to put a synergistic activity that might demonstrate have you have you any training? You could include your training, of course, if you have a degree in education or something like that, or certification. Um, but you could also include narration about prior work and and especially what impact that's had. I also think this is common. It's it's very common, and I'm, I'm glad it is for our PIs to propose efforts to broaden participation or engage and mentor students from communities that are underrepresented in their field of study. And we often get reviewers saying, well, this is, this is a good, this is a well-intentioned proposal um, and well-intentioned activities, but are these evidence-based activities? Does this PI have experience and success in mentoring students from groups that are currently underrepresented in our field? And so um, I think if you have experience and, and, and um, success in these areas, it's really important to highlight it. And the synergistic activity section is a great place to do that so that reviewers can look for evidence of your qualifications because they are looking for it. And so finding ways to weave that into a proposal through the biosketch and also through the project description, I think is really, um, is a really important thing for PIs to think about in the evaluation of the broader impacts. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Hilary, do you have anything to add for this question? Yeah, so um, building on a lot of like what Sean and Laura have said, I'm just going to say that um, I would say in terms of what reviewers and panels are most looking to value is about, yes, while they look at the past as um, reassurance that you actually have the capability to deliver on this opportunity and this proposal, they also want to see the potential, the trajectory. And that's something for a particularly a lot of early career um, uh, mid-career, like all career stages, essentially to demonstrate um, because that's something that will help reassure in terms of, um, you know, coming down to decisions. Um, but also in terms of this is where it comes into things like, say, the interdisciplinary aspect. You know, if you have got unique skills and working across an interdisciplinary kind of landscape takes a lot of skills and expertise, like to be able to translate across different disciplines and also to be able to cross pollinate like that is a unique set skill in itself um, I would not undersell that um, you know and this is often like where some of the best solutions come for some of the biggest problems um, for example uh, a very successful uh, water project um, which was led by water engineers and water scientists actually ended up working quite closely with behavioral econom economists because the people's relationship with water and their business or the livelihoods went hand in hand and it ended up being quite a unique proposal and team that it was something that the funders had never seen before so really don't undersell yourself in those aspects um, 
And in terms of the length of the CV, um, yeah, definitely, you know, we've got to bear in mind how much time goes into these, but also how much time goes into reading them. And when you might have a funding call where you've got thousands of applications coming in, we also have a duty of care to both the review people who fill it in and the people who read it in terms of being, it, being able to access the information they need to be able to make the decision um, while also, you know, the key attributes that you're presenting not getting lost in pages and pages. Um, so that's why it's kept quite short um, as well. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to move on to the second theme, um, which is reviewing a narrative CV. So what help is available for those evaluating narrative CV, narrative style CVs for the first time? And what is the biggest difference in evaluating a narrative style CV to an academic and two page industry style CV? Um, and Sean and Laura are also going to help us with this one to start with. So this is a really good question. And I think we've been focusing a lot on the applicant side, right? In terms of the last couple of years and develop, okay, let's develop the template, let's develop the guidance. And we haven't done as much work on the reviewing side yet. Um, there are some resources that, that are available. Um, a, the first thing I would suggest is talk to your funding agency, right? Talk to or, or whoever is asking you to review and evaluate this narrative style CV. Um, they will be able to give you the best guidance because there's a reason why they're, why they're using it. Um, there's other guidance out there. For example, um, we've put out a video with Dora, co-produced with Dora, which is focused a little bit on the panel side, but can still work for a kind of a remote evaluation, like a reviewer side as well. That's practical tips for um, uh, for reviewers around responsible research assessment. It doesn't dive directly into the narrative CV, but it gives the overarching themes. We show it before all of our panels. Um, and then different countries have developed different things as well. For example, we put uh, in the chat here a link to the Norwegian career assessment matrix, which kind of is a rubric for thinking about things around the, the narrative style CV and, and the outputs and achievements that are demonstrated there. And I mean, in terms of the biggest difference, it's the idea that you don't want to depend only on the quantitative information, right, which can lead to, or, and, you know, can maybe lead to using more shortcuts, which might lead to conscious or unconscious bias. And it's the idea of broadening, thinking from a bro on a broader scale about what that person has done and how it relates to the, to the project or a proposal. Laura. Yeah, this is a good question. I, I will acknowledge I don't think there is a ton of guidance from NSF specifically on evaluating the CV. But um, I mentioned in my presentation, of course, we have the two merit review criteria, intellectual merit broader impacts and then these five research questions. And we do, there's a lot of training for reviewers to focus on those criteria and those questions. And we actually provide training for, especially for panelists, because we have more interaction with panelists. We provide a lot of training on um, evidence-based assessment and trying to avoid, um, avoid the unavoidable, which is introducing implicit bias into the evaluation and doing that by evidence-based assessment. And so, um, you know, the, the evaluation, the narrative style, or the, the bio sketch is really focused on the connections with those two broad review criteria and the specific questions I mentioned. I would say in, in terms of like evaluating a, a, a CV submitted with a proposal versus an industry style CV, I mean, similarly, I really, I, I think that both, of course, are tailored to the application, right? If you submit an industry style industry style CV to an industry job, you probably don't send the same resume or CV to every uh, job application. And I think the same should really be true of your bio sketch, um, given the limited amount of information that can be included in an NSF bio sketch. It's important to be tailored to the proposal, and that will help reviewers draw connections between rather than just evaluating the person broadly, evaluating the connection between the person's qualifications and what's proposed in the, in the application, right? What are the connections there as opposed to just the overall qualifications, like getting into what Sean talked about, like just numbers of publications. It's really about what are the publications related to the proposed work and how do they demonstrate that the person has the qualifications and capabilities to execute what they proposed. So yeah, really coupling the evaluation of the CV 
to our, our explicit review criteria. Thanks. Nice. Um, Hilary, have you, would you like to add um, any further comments? No, I, I'm okay for now. Okay, great. Um, so we're going to move on to the, the third theme, um, which is diversity, equity, um, inclusion, and accessibility. Um, so why is the narrative style CV an equity measure and what features make it effective at mitigating against different types of bias? How can we use the narrative style CV to respectfully represent the contribution of Indigenous partners and um, collaborators? Um, and should caregiving responsibilities and career breaks be highlighted in an narrative style CV? Um, and Hilary and Laura are going to help us out with this one. Super. Um, well, as I kind of mentioned earlier, um, the narrative style CV is essentially being co-produced with the community in mind. Um, and, you know, so it is directly a tool that the community want to see being used. Um, it, it really expands what is considered as like successful um, and what is, you know, key contributions from somebody who works in research and innovation. And then having like the, the four kind of uh, skeletal areas, you know, and much like the Biosketch one as well about kind of asking for things like, you know, your career paths and things like that, it helps you uh, highlight non-linear career paths, which can um, sometimes, you know, be very prescriptive. Um, so some areas might only recognize certain kind of career paths as being valued or, you know, valid, which isn't necessarily the case. So being able to expand on that and have the context to be able to explain how certain kind of pathways have maybe informed your skills and experience and how that makes you the best person or team to undertake this proposal or opportunity, I think is uh, really good in that sense. Um, and also in terms of, you know, remove, moving away from like the very narrow definitions and things like metrics and you know, just long, 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 long list of publications can like move away from this sense of, you know, um, continuous productivity. And as we've seen, even in the COVID pandemic that, you know, there's that the, the change in roles in houses and things like that actually affected a lot of um, women who published. Um, so that actually tipped things in the favor of men and their publication numbers. So there's a lot of um, expanding what's visible and valued. And when we also say what, we also mean who. Um, so it's about like also having space to document career breaks, whether whatever that reason that might be, whether it's ill health or care responsibilities. Um, but also that there's, uh, you know, high level principles that not everybody has to do everything. So if you leave a module blank, you're not going to be penalised by it for it. And that is something that we've committed to in the joint funder group and how we're using the narrative CVs. Um, in terms of things like respectfully representing the contributions of Indigenous partners and collaborators, um, one of the key things I think is important in this is the the set, a section around you know contributions to society so about you know you explain and can contextualize where your research has actually been informed because sometimes it comes from the communities and the end users of research rather than just being created in a vacuum um, and also how it's you know you're working with that community to make sure that it um, actually is authentic and co-produced but one of the, my favorite things about um, the narrative CV is it helps to highlight diverse knowledge. So it's not just about outputs that go into publications or grants and things like that. It could be that you're a fantastic person working in research and innovation and you actually are, uh, you know, amazing in social sciences and you're the best interviewer doing ethnography ever and that is something you know working with the community in that way but also highlighting the diverse knowledges and reducing those barriers so there's more porosity of different kinds of knowledge in the system um, and things like the resume library by making everything freely available will help people who are in different communities, not necessarily anchored to the traditional academic institutions to be able to help democratize the knowledge to help move um, more people and ideas in the system. Um, and things like in terms of caregiving responsibilities and career breaks, you can. There's a section in the narrative CVs where you can um, 
explain that, to give context to some of your career, maybe inform some of your research as well. But also we're asking that everybody in our communities are highlighting how that information will be used. So what role it will play in any decision making process so people are informed um, at the point of disclosure as well. So I pass over to Laura. Thanks, Hillary. I um, that was such a nice answer. I don't. I, I only have a few things, maybe to add. Just like because NS, NSF biosketches are so structured, um, I think there's just some pros and cons to that. Uh, so in terms of it being an equity measure, um, I do like things like it's not a. It doesn't present information in a linear way. So like for example. You know, if you had a break in a publication record or, um, I don't know, just um, uh, variability and like how many production publications you have in one year versus the other, it, it, the information is not presented in that way. It's not about how many publications and, you know, they're not presented in chronological order. So I think some of those um, potential gaps or differences between applicants are not as, as visible and easy to compare like as, as compared to when you're evaluating traditional CVs for like maybe an academic job application where you see this tendency to focus on the number of publications, the number per year, you know, the, the those like counts of things. And so um, I think that can be very helpful in terms of like the product section. Um, and then, you know, I do think um, the, even the appointments, you know, it's um, again, you don't, you really um, can include your current appointment. I mean, there's some requirements, all, all current appointments you have to disclose because, you know, there's some conflict questions there. Um, but you're not required to list all appointments you've had in chronological order, right? You're listing those that are related to the project and include your current appointment, of course. Um, and also like those appointments, you know, there's a, some flexibility in terms of including things that are full-time or part-time or paid or not paid. You know, people can have affiliations with different institutions and different organizations and different roles. And if they demonstrate kind of network qualifications, um, you know, there's opportunity to include them. Um, and then, so I would say like the caregiving responsibilities, I actually think there's not an, I would say, I don't see an obvious way to, directly address that in the in the NSF biosketch but I also think um, I, the biosketch structure helps avoid draw attention to any any um, the, any non nonlinearity in in someone's career trajectory just the way that it's structured and so um, hopefully that's effective for for increasing equity like I was thinking early career researcher versus senior researcher. I mean, 10 research products, five mostly most, most related, and then the five that you think are the most significant, you know, that can really level the playing field. Um, and, and those products can, don't have to be journal articles. You know, they can be other types of things as long as they're discoverable. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Sean, do you have anything um, to add? I'm good. Those are great answers. Okay, great. Um, so very quickly, just uh, because of time. Um, so for scene four, um, this is around where a narrative CV is used, which sectors use narrative style CVs, and are the differences in narrative style CVs between female and sectors outside. Um, and to start us with this one, um, Hillary will help. Okay, I'll give you a very quick um, answer. Um, they start, the narrative CVs are largely taking off, if I'm honest, in around funders at the moment. Um, and we've you know, heard, as you've obviously heard from a lot of funders today, but we've also got the, um, a lot of employers, learning societies, um, professional bodies who are starting to also use them in recruitment, promotion, mentoring, chartership, all sorts of things. Um, and they, in terms of what sectors already really use narrative CVs, to be honest, a lot of them already do, even if you kind of akin it to a, a cover letter, 
you know, uh, where you explain how you meet the criteria of the job description and you outline your experience. And it's, you know, you usually keep it to two pages um, just um, uh, to keep it succinct. So essentially, this is us trying to um, catch up with what happens in other sectors as well in order to have more porosity between different sectors and different disciplines. Um, in, and, in other sectors, in terms of what they use, often the focus around CVs will be on things like how you look at efficiencies, how you know your commercialization, um, leading or influencing a particular agenda or teams um, at all levels, not just very senior. You know they're looking for that early on. But one thing I've noticed a great trend is people talking about lessons learned, so things that went wrong and how they've actually achieved that or how their career breaks have actually helped them springboard into something different or influence their direction of travel. Um, and in terms of um, whether when it's best to use a narrative CV or short style um, CVs, I would just say things like follow the guidance of the organization you're applying to, because they will usually tell you what kind of information they want in what particular way. Um, and I think I have covered all of those which sectors use narratives yeah i think i've got them so far okay great um so i'm now gonna uh, cut to breakouts